Okay, next is uh, Rob Viglione. Uh, Rob uh, comes specially from South Carolina, where he teaches a course on blockchain. Um, and he's going to talk to us about uh, crypto economics, which is a very interesting topic. And right after Rob, we'll break for lunch. So enjoy. Thank you, Rob. Yeah, okay, great. Cool, guys. So um, I know I'm the last guy between you and food, so I'm going to try to make this pretty quick. Don't worry about that. Um, but it's a really cool topic. And uh, so I'm co-founder of Zen Cash. We have a cool booth out there. I believe the number is 39. Come check it out. Say hi. Um, our, our team's pretty awesome. Uh, they would love to chat with people. Um, now, I'm also kind of lucky to be able to span academia and industry here. So I have two different perspectives. And um, the cool thing is we have nothing really to sell you. So I'm not here to raise money, do an ICO or anything like that. So I can be brutally honest with where we are as, as an industry. And I can be honest from from the, the business side and then also from the academic side where we can bring together some things that are really basic to like Econ 101 that often, unfortunately, get overlooked in this industry. So let's just dive right in. The, the title, I, I personally love this title. Um, if there are any cypherpunks out there, you know, good for you. So this, this I put up here just to kind of let you guys know where we come from as her, our, our heritage in this industry. We came from a funny group of people called cypherpunks. Right, they were trying to use cryptography to induce social change, basically under the premise that human beings have a right, a fundamental human right to privacy. So that's where we started, and that's kind of the crowd that Satoshi came from. We've come a long way from there. So I'll also talk about you know, some of the, the, our, our personal path. I'll give you a little inside scoop of what it's like to, to kind of run a, a startup in this industry. Um, so as investors, this is an investor show, uh, I, I want to be completely frank with you guys so you can see, learn from our lessons and don't invest in other, other companies that are kind of going down uh, maybe the, the, not the best path. So my background, right, I, I've been in this industry for a while. My original background was I was actually a military scientist working uh, with, uh, you know, uh, satellite ra radars and launch vehicles and such. But then I came into crypto and it's been a really fun ride since then. So the... The point of where Bitcoin came from was to make sure that things like this could stop happening. This is a street scene from Venezuela where oftentimes the, the utility functions for people who are running govern, governments are not the same utility functions for their citizens. Right? So oftentimes governments and people in governments can maximize their own benefits and you get situations like this. So the technology has promise to liberate people. The technology has promise to tear down uh, walls and make people's lives measurably better around the world. There's a huge amount of capital flowing into the industry. So I, I want to just take a step back and just kind of do a big picture perspective of what's going on uh, because there is a lot going on and there's people that are kind of detractors of the industry and there's plenty of reasons to be skeptical of, of what's going on but you can't deny that there's a ton of money flowing in. So market capitalizations, it changes every minute but we were looking at about half a trillion dollars, you know, somewhere between 400 billion to 500 billion, even after kind of prices have come off of their, their big highs of about three quarters of a trillion dollars. So you could look at this and say, this industry is massively overvalued, right? So much money has flown in already, or you could now start doing other asset class comparisons and realize this is still a really tiny fraction. If what we're doing makes sense, and if what we're doing ends up being successful, this really is still a fraction of where we're going. Uh, we've, we've seen a, a crowdfunding explosion. So the, the whole ICO thing, um, the, the initial coin offerings. So there's good and there's bad. What's really cool now is that the floodgates have been opened for peer-to-peer -peer, you know, crowdfunding investment to startups and other firms that are trying to raise capital. Um, there's some downsides, and I'll talk about those downsides. Just the basic Econ 101 stuff that we really shouldn't forget. But there's a serious amount of money flowing in. So Telegram, the most recent ICO, uh, raised $850 million. Um, and other, other projects have raised hundreds of millions of dollars. Sometimes the projects are just ridiculous, where it'll be some, some kids with uh, maybe, maybe like a, a nice minimum viable product. If you're lucky, oftentimes they throw up a nice website. Uh, and then they put together a white paper. Good for them if they actually do the white paper in LaTeX. Oftentimes, it'll just be in like Word or, or some other uh, document formatting tool. But they're raising tens of millions of dollars for doing this sometimes. I mean, things are slowing down uh, quite a bit from the, the absolute hype. Um, but there are plenty of other really good companies 
that are legitimately raising capital this way. So you have good and bad. It's important to know how to differentiate the two. Venture capital. So these guys are often known as the smart guys uh, in the startup world. They, they do due diligence, they have a ton of experience, and they have teams that analyze the heck out of everything that they put money into. And when these guys start putting money into projects, it at a minimum signals that there's something going on here. So right now we're looking at about two and a half billion dollars of venture capital has already flowed into blockchain startups. Um, and we just started in 2009, really. So this is, this is good, it's interesting. Um, now, they're not gonna be, you know, they're humans, they're fallible as well, so maybe there's something going on here that maybe they're making a mistake. But at a minimum, there are plenty of other people who are serious investors who are putting money in. So we are entering what I call the age of crypto finance, where essentially we're Uberizing finance. Uh, we're not going to Uberize everything. We're not going to carve out you know, all of JP Morgan's line of business or Goldman Sachs line of business. But what we are doing is we're another serious fintech player. Um, and we are able to carve out certain functions in the space. So some things that we have right now is we're, we're we are revolutionizing the way we even think about money. So plenty of people say, you know, Bitcoin or cryptocurrencies aren't real money, and that's fine. Um, I think they're mistaken. I think that if you look at money as essentially a service, and you have some parameters or some value propositions you're offering as a service, um, we are a competitor in that domain. Central banks have a huge first mover advantage, and they have plenty of other support, you know, as, as national governments and supported by national governments. So. Uh, the, it's hard to, to see us as viable competitors to central banks, but I think that there is something going on because there's plenty of people out there, like myself included, who wanted an alternative. And now we have alternatives, and we have alternatives that are essentially, we've moved money into the competitive domain instead of having money in the monopolistic domain. And there's a whole bunch of interesting stuff, guaranteed will come out of that. So, hold on. Uh, okay, I'll try not to make too much noise, guys. Uh, and uh, we're, there's a whole bunch of other finance, uh, you know, areas that we're disrupting, kind of remittance, cross-border remittance, asset settlement. Why should it take three days to actually sell an asset and then receive the funds? That, that, that makes no sense in the 21st century, right? So I, I also teach a uh, finance honors program at, at the University of South Carolina. And I always tell my students, uh, look at what we're doing here, because you don't want to be caught on the wrong side of the technolo technology history. Right? You don't want to prep yourself for a career, say in uh, you know, investment banking, where a, a key part of your business relies on this delay in asset settlement. That part of your business is probably going to go away. Sorry for the hiccup there. Maybe you want to swap this out? OK. How's that? Can you guys hear me? Yeah. Awesome. Cool. So, all right. We could go down the whole line of kind of uh, finance uh, functions that are out there. And I guarantee some will be disrupted. Others are just hype. So there's, there's always businesses kind of popping up in this industry that say, look at this trillion dollar industry. I'm going to disrupt it completely. Therefore, I should be worth a trillion dollars. Uh, that's, that's not the case. Um, so every, every business that tries to get in here, there's some chance that they're going to be disruptive, and there's a whole bunch of other chances that they're not. Um, but I am excited, though, that we're actually starting to compete against things that really weren't competitive parts of the, the economy previously. Uh, an interesting thing from just uh, you know, why I got into this industry is um, you know, cryptocurrencies, your private keys, are essentially like the new version of a bearer bond. So it's like a digital bearer bond where you own your assets, you own your money directly, and no one can take that from you unless they actually steal your, your private keys. Right? So that's a whole different set of problems. But you don't have to ask permission is the point. Is your claim to ownership on, it could be millions and millions or tens of millions of dollars in assets, boils down to a private key that you can control. That's liberating, but also extremely scary. I, I argue that there's a huge entrepreneurial opportunity here to make sure that people you know, have the same assurances that they have in, in the modern banking system where they don't have to worry about their bank account being unloaded on them tomorrow um, by, you know, a, a hack. But there, there's a whole bunch of opportunities here. And in the, in the asset management space as well, um, I, I think every asset manager has to start caring about Bitcoin. They have to start caring about this industry. Even, like, from, from the pure academic perspective of 
the return patterns for Bitcoin or other cryptocurrencies do not co-vary with any of the other traditional asset classes. So any money managers out there, that's a beautiful thing. If you want to, if you have a positive expected return asset that has a, a co, that doesn't co-vary with other other assets, even though itself, you know, by itself could be massively volatile, adding that into your portfolio because of the covariance matrix will actually significantly decrease your portfolio volatility. Okay, so that's a beautiful thing, and every asset manager needs to start considering this. Uh, there, like I said, there's a ton of money. I, I don't think I said the magnitude before, but uh, almost $9 billion into ICOs, and just essentially since 2017, really, like, is when things really started taking off. So there's a short little window with a ton of capital flowing in. Um, and there are skeptics, and they're, they're right to be skeptical. Everyone should be skeptical, right? We, we don't want to be too, too overly optimistic here. Uh, but some of the skeptics, I would argue, are kind of outlandish, and I, I think that they're, they're a little silly. So guys like Paul Krugman actually called Bitcoin evil. And his, his motivation was, you know, we're, we're taking power away from central banks, and central banks are good, therefore you're evil. Uh, that, that's kind of a childish argument, I, I would say. There's a whole lot of other social good that we're doing out there. Um, Robert Schiller, or Bob Schiller, this guy loves to call asset bubbles. That's how he's really become famous. Um, it, what I always tell people is, if you do a rain dance long enough, it'll eventually rain. So, you know, he'll eventually be right. I mean, we're, we're in a bit of a sell-off right now. Maybe he's claiming victory. But he also said that in 2014. And if you listen to him back then, you're probably feeling really bad about yourself right now. All right. So, uh, Jamie Dimon, um, so the, the CEO of JP Morgan, he, he was actually called Bitcoin a fraud, uh, while simultaneously some of his traders and his firm were actually loading up on it. So, a little bit of a, a conflict there. Uh, but maybe his personal opinion is that it's a fraud. Uh, I think that's going a little too far. He's since retracted that statement. Warren Buffett, Charlie Munger, and now we can add Bill Gates to this list of famous guys who hate this industry. Uh, Bitcoin or uh, Buffett calls Bitcoin a joke. Munger goes even further and says that we're a noxious poison the government should stomp out. You know, as if we're you know some band of you know happy criminals that are going out there and intentionally trying to defraud the world. Um, I think it's really arrogant. And I, I don't think that they really understand what they're talking about. And what's interesting about Buffett and Munger uh, is that they, they're notorious for not investing in tech stocks because they, they, they claim that they don't understand technology. And they even said they don't understand Bitcoin. But I find it also kind of curious. And if you don't understand it, why are you so uh, you know, firm in your beliefs that it's absolute garbage? So th this is to say that there's some really prestigious people out there who, uh, you know, are not happy with what we're doing. And I can say, realistically, we have some real problems. And if we're going to be successful in this industry, whether you're an entrepreneur or you're an investor, you have to be realistic about the problems. So just the Econ 101 stuff. We know there's massive inefficiencies in the ICO gold rush, for instance. If you're going to have a flood of capital flowing in, I, I really don't believe that in just kind of automatically efficient markets. I think we're human beings. I think we're fallible. And I think people often make mistakes. And I can tell you, I've been you know, offered to invest in a lot of different ICO projects. And the, the usual pitch is, hey, Rob, um, there's this great ICO. I need your money like, in two hours to, to put it in there. And I'm like, nah, guys, you know, that, that's cool. Good luck with everything. But that's not how you should be investing. And I guarantee you, there's a lot of other people who don't know, you know very much about this industry who are flooding uh, money in. Because they, we, we had a, a kind of a virtuous feedback loop originally over the last year. You put money into any project and you got rich, right? So th this uh, this feedback loop may may not be the right thing for the long term, right? So the reality is it may not always keep going up, and you know if you don't do your due diligence, there's probably going to be some issues. Uh, early on, this isn't as much of a problem now, but early on there were rarely any legal claims with your ICO tokens. So it's not like you're buying a share of stock. It's not like you're buying a debenture, you know, some debt instrument with a, a payment schedule that you have a legal claim on. There was none of that. And still in this industry, it's not uh, pervasive enough where you are actually getting you know, legal claims to assets when you're buying these tokens. So keep this in mind. Now, so a lot of firms are moving to you know, uh, security tokens, which um, actually does come with some legal right. So, but you just have to know what you're getting into. Um, I, I'm an asset pricer. That's what my PhD research is in, actually Bitcoin asset pricing specifically. And uh, I, I, I can tell you, there, there's no asset pricing model that we know of that could rationally price these things. We have no idea. If anyone tells you what they think the price of Bitcoin should be, uh, they're, they're making it up. 
There, there's no way, logically. It's not like you have a, a, a company that has a revenue stream or a profit stream that you could forecast, you know, rationally discount, and then come up with a valuation number. There's nothing like that. The way that I look at it, though, which I think is interesting, is uh, I look at this as these are infrastructure plays. Not the ICOs. Like, those, those are actually, like, you know, uh, venture, you're betting on a specific venture. But uh, projects like ours, like Bitcoin, it's an infrastructure play. So what you're betting on is that there's going to be a whole bunch of stuff built on top of this infrastructure that need to use the, the token or the coin you know, to actually access the infrastructure. And how do you value that? Because really, it's, it's kind of a, you know, um, an unbounded set of real options of what we can build on top of the stuff. So uh, th that doesn't mean that these things should be worth infinity. right? There has to be some kind of rational boundary there. Uh, but w what is important to know, though, is that we, we have no way to like, anchor these valuations in reality. And that's why I think that we have such extreme volatility, one of the reasons, because we really don't know what these things should be worth. Um, and just from a, a mainstream perspective, like I, I want to see this technology go mainstream, but we're not there <laughs> by, by a long stretch. We're not there. We're, we're trying to race there. Like we're trying to race there. Zen Cash. We're trying to we're trying to get there. We think we, we have a kind of a credible path to get there. Um, there's a lot of other projects that are doing really good work to get there, but we're not. So you're not going to convince a merchant that has a supply a supply chain denominated in British pounds to accept Zen. You know, and then manage that exchange rate risk themselves. So it's not going to happen. Their revenue stream has to match their, their supply chain, right? Their, their uh, kind of out, outstream. So what we need to do, though, and what we are going to do, is create price-stable assets. So this stuff, it's not rocket science. We'll have price-stable assets. We'll have a digital you know, British pound. We already have digital representations of the dollar, euro. So uh, th this stuff is coming. But until we actually get it, you know, be a little skeptical. Um, I, I probably don't have too much time here. Probably another five, five or ten minutes or so. But yeah, you guys want me to leave already? <laughs> Come on. Okay. <laughs> cool. But what I wanted to share, and I think this is unique because I'm not. I don't want to just rehash the same stuff. And you guys can go to Coin Market Cap and look at valuations yourself or whatnot. But what what is valuable is to hear our our lessons learned. And we launched as a startup in this industry uh, almost a year ago. And I, I can tell you, it was a horrible launch. This is probably the, the worst launch in startup history. And we survived, right? It sucked, though. And we went through a lot of pain. But the good thing was that we, we pulled together an awesome team, awesome community, and we could get, keep getting kicked in the gut or punched in the gut and get back up and keep, keep fighting. Uh, so what I've learned personally is uh, focus on the teams. So don't just focus on the product. Don't focus on the marketing and the hype or whatnot. Uh, focus on the team. Are these the kind of people that if they get knocked down, because we're all going to be knocked down plenty of times as startup entrepreneurs or you know, even just with market cycles, you want to bet on the guys who aren't going to just quit and who are going to get right back up into the fight. Uh, we spent six months, actually, after our abysmal start, which was actually kind of a, uh, a huge personnel issue. I'll, I'll be political, political about that. Uh, and it, 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 was, it was horrible. Um, and th these teams in this industry, um, so f for me working on other projects in this industry as well, the teams can be very immature. And it pisses me off now, actually. <laughs> you know, uh, you, you shouldn't be playing with other people's money and be immature about it. But uh, oftentimes people don't care. They're so narcissistic or they have other personal issues and they're not professional and they could, they could completely torpedo a project. And we see this all the time. We're way too often in this industry. So pay attention to the team. Bet on the guys who actually have a professional team. It took us six months to go from chaos to I think we're, we're kind of kicking butt right now. We have about 50 people. We're professionalized completely, organized into seven divisions, and actually operating like a real organization, which is kind of weird in, in an industry where there's like 1,500 other projects, and maybe like a, a few dozen of them or so are actually operating like you know, real businesses or organizations. Um, so you have to look for more in a team than just a few guys who can code. You have to look for more than just a nice website. You have to look for more than just a nice white paper. You have to have a, a completely diversified and complete team. So I'm really proud to say that we have awesome team. We have a team that we have, we have an awesome engineering division, but we also have an awesome business development team. We have an awesome marketing team, PR. Right, our ops team is great. We have a finance team where we actually do budgeting, do forecasting, do reserve management, hedging, and stuff like that. Things that you would expect from an actual organization, which I guarantee you, of the 1,500 or so projects out there, there aren't very many of them doing stuff like that. So th these are some of the big lessons that I learned. But really importantly for this industry in particular, uh, it's kind of like when Apple first started. And the, they, they had this diehard group around, a uh, diehard group of users that would do anything to get new Apple products. You need that. 
in this industry. Uh, and we were really lucky to get it. So our, our community from the start was pretty amazing. And it's just grown since then. But it, it's a two-way street. You can't just expect your community to just keep giving to you. You have to constantly figure out how can you make their lives better. What can you do? How can you be more inclusive? How can you give them more opportunities? How do you listen to them appropriately? If you have tens of thousands of people or hundreds of thousands of people around the world, how do you get their input and actually translate this into product output or some sort of other, other decision to manage the project? Right? It's difficult. Um, but I think we're, we're, we're starting to do a pretty good job. You can see the chaos. This is a little market snapshot of when we first launched. We just went off a cliff when this guy tried to torpedo the project. It was horrible, guys. Um, but uh, what, what we, the sweet spot that we have now is that we're kind of a, a hybrid lean startup with an R&D incubator, which is also important because a lot of projects just, you know, they, they go the engineering route, which is great. You know, come up with a pro a, some sort of product. You think it's going to service a market, some market demand, and you run with it. And then you get feedback. Hopefully, these guys are actually getting feedback on what's going on. And you pivot as you have to. And you keep doing this. You iterate. You improve over time. But there is a, a, a very important function to actually step back, pause, and think. And this is where the scientists and kind of the deep R&D comes from. And this is also really important for every project out there that really wants to have a lasting impact. And you have to do both. Uh, so, I mean, for us, we're, we're kind of running out of time here, but I, I don't know if anyone here really is very familiar with, with our project, but we're, we're, I think we're doing things right. We, we, we're off to a horrible start. I think we've pivoted completely and reorged, and, and things are going really well. From a technology perspective, we're, we're really just a massively private and decentralized network. And on top of that, you can do a whole bunch of stuff. It's kind of, you know, unbounded, the kind of stuff that you can do on top of it. We've, we've gone down an initial path of building some products that are, that are pretty cool. So we're, no, no, first of all, I can say we're about as decentralized a node count as Bitcoin. In just two months of operating the system we call our secure node system, where we pay people to run a node with you know, some, some elevated security and uptime requirements. And that's really cool. The point of that, though, wasn't just to get nodes for the sake of nodes. It was now to have a massive asset that you can start building stuff on top of. So that's what we have. And now we're building stuff. So we, we built a messaging, a really, really secure messaging protocol. It's not going to replace Telegram tomorrow because it's probably more secure, I'll say, because we use snarks and zero knowledge cryptography to send transactions or send messages uh, across the, the blockchain. But you're not going to you're not going to see teenagers with you know w with our app there and like chatting with their with their buddies. That's just not going to happen. It takes like 30 seconds to send a, a snark based transaction these days. But it's a first step. We're laying the infrastructure for when that computational burden collapses. We're already there. The protocol is developed, and we can massively scale that. We're building our own version of like a, a decentralized uh, Dropbox, a, a distributed file storage system. Um, and there's a whole other coin projects that are doing this. This is one of the apps that we're building on top of our network. Um, and all these other projects, they're kind of starting from scratch. And you can go out there and put together the, the, the software for distributed file storage. But then you have to go and build out a network to actually you know, store data. Right? We already have the network. So now we're starting to do stuff with it. Uh, censorship resistance is really important to us, just fundamentally. This is why I got into Bitcoin, and this is really important to me, that we, we make sure that anyone in the world has equal access to our system. So we can't make the world completely fair and equal overnight, but we, what we can do is start tearing down the, the artificial access points, the barriers to accessing systems. So what we want to do is we're building something called Zenhide, where if you're in part of the world that doesn't want you to access a cryptocurrency network or, say, the Internet, you can do that through us. I think that's a really important function that, that I'm really happy about our team to working on. Some of the really big uh, R&D things, like I said, R&D is very important. We have two serious R&D projects right now. One is governance is, is a massive issue in this industry. Uh, you know, Bitcoin went for years with, with a, a governance problem that kind of devolved into you know, people acting like kids, bullying each other, which is just silly. Um, it, it, so we're trying to tackle this stuff now. We're, we're building a voting system directly into our protocol so that the resources that we have as a community could now you know, be taken out of our hands directly as a team and put into the hands of the community directly. And we're leveraging game theory research and building what we think will be the, the serious next generation voting system. There's other projects that have voting systems through like master nodes like Dash. This is going to be, I think, technologically for sure, a big leapfrog past there, where we're actually paying attention to economics and technology, using you know, zero knowledge cryptography for secret balloting, um, and solving some issues with you know, voting systems like voter apathy. 
Um, we're, building, we're, we're taking scaling seriously because we actually want to be a fully end-to-end -end economic system. And a big part of an economic system isn't just having a coin that kind of goes be, trades between speculators. You actually want it to be used. And you're not going to have a, a, an actual payment system that's used until we have massive transaction throughput through the system. You shouldn't have to wait an hour for confirmations to make sure that there's no double spend, right? You want things to be done in seconds. So we're actually looking at right now a, a, a really big in, improvement to our, our core protocol, migrating from a, a blockchain to a directed acyclic graph. So this is just essentially generalizing the blockchain. And instead of every miner just having a hash pointer to the previous block, you have a hash pointer to every known tip in the tree structure. So we can do, for instance, we, we can set a parameter like we want 12 blocks solved simultaneously per second. We set that parameter on average, right? And now we can have something like you know, 2,000 plus transactions per second going through our system. So things like that I think are really important to start thinking about the future and not just being so reactive to the market and reactive to the price and reactive to just like the, the product cycle. Um, you, you need a strong product cycle. You need a strong team that can actually do stuff like that. But you need to think longer, think deeper in the R&D front. So the big takeaways I have for you guys, you're, you're all investors, that's why you're here, right? Okay, yeah, no problem. So just don't waste your money. You know? <laughs> put, put your money in good projects, make, it, make a killing, that's great. Um, but really, like, let's be honest, there's a ton of issues with the industry. So, so you know, do your due diligence, understand what you're investing in, and look at the teams. So that's all I have, guys. I, I don't think I have any time for Q&A, but you can check us out, zencash.com, and swing by the booth, number 39. Thank you.